A protecting group prevents a particular functional group from reacting. In this lesson, we're going to go over some strategy of using protecting groups. We're not going to go through a lot of mechanisms, but we'll look at several examples of when to use a protecting group, and we'll look at one example of a good one. I think this topic is best explained with examples, so let's just dive right in. Say that we want to carry out the following synthesis. We want to convert this ethyl ester into this tertiary alcohol over here. We have an aldehyde on the molecule, and we want that to remain as an aldehyde throughout the course of the reaction. First, let's devise our general reaction sequence that'll allow us to perform this reaction and get our tertiary alcohol. Now that we're focusing on just this piece of the molecule, we can see that we need the OET group to leave. We also need to add in two ethyl groups. And a great way to add in a carbon nucleophile, to add an alkyl group into a molecule, is by using a Grignard reagent. Esters actually will smoothly react with two equivalents of the Grignard reagent, and then a protonation step will give us this alcohol here. I'll draw out the intermediate after the first equivalent of Grignard reagent attacks, in case you're a little unfamiliar with this reaction or don't remember it. So the Grignard nucleophile attacks here, that pushes the electrons up onto oxygen, giving this tetrahedral intermediate. And then these electrons can push down, kicking out the ethoxy leaving group, that gives a ketone, which is attacked a second time by the Grignard reagent. Okay, great. So what's the problem with applying that reaction to this transformation here? Well, the problem is that the ethyl ester over here is not the most reactive part of the molecule. We have this aldehyde, and this aldehyde is prone to attack. It's even more reactive than the ester. The ester has resonance from the lone pair on this oxygen that's actually stabilizing this functional group. The aldehyde doesn't have a group over here, just a little small hydrogen atom. And so it's um, not very sterically hindered. It doesn't have the stabilizing resonance. So actually our aldehyde will want to react first and it'll do so more readily than our ester. So here's our complication drawn out. We're doomed to get mixtures of the ethyl group adding in over here and some over here. Our solution is to use a protecting group to mask this aldehyde. There are three criteria for a protecting group. It must be easy to put on. Then it must be unreactive toward all the conditions that the molecule needs to go through. So every reaction that you put it on for, it has to be compatible with it. And then in the end, it should be easy to remove. For this problem, we can use an acetal protecting group. Let's check out our synthesis. Now the fact that the aldehyde is much more reactive than the ester doesn't doom our synthesis. It's actually an advantage for introducing the protecting group. If we treat this molecule with this diol, ethylene glycol, in the presence of acid, this group is more reactive, so it will react to form an acetal protecting group, and the ester will stay in this form. The acetal is a base stable protecting group that is removed in acid. So we put it on using acid, then we can remove it by acidic hydrolysis. Since it's base stable, we can now apply these conditions above and the acidic conditions of our workup might just be enough to remove this protecting group too. So in this first step, the reaction happens where we add in our ethyl group twice. And then when we're protonating this, we might be able to just heat it up and remove our protecting group at the same time. Let's call this target molecule 1, and we form that by this sequence using the acetal protecting group. Let's check out another example. In this example, we're also forming an alcohol. And we're reacting this piece of the molecule, this maps on over here, and we're adding a new alcohol and a phenyl group. It might benefit us to think about where we're breaking this molecule, do a little retrosynthesis, to see the pieces that we might have to put together to actually form this. 
So over here we have one, two, three, four carbon atoms. So if we go one, two, three, four, we'll see that we need to cleave the molecule here. Well, when I see a bromide, I think Grignard reagent. Let's take a moment to look at synthons, the hypothetical electrophiles and nucleophiles that we would use to form this target molecule too. Over on this side, we were talking about forming a Grignard from this bromide. So this would be our nucleophilic piece. Now let's consider what this side would look like. This fragment would have to be our electrophile with some positive character on this carbon. But a thing that we can think about is when we have an OH group next to a carbocation, what would that look like if the oxygen donated in its electrons and formed a bond? The reagent that we would use would be this epoxide, and Grignard's very smoothly open at the least sterically hindered side of the epoxide. So we'd expect this to attach over here just like we want. So that's awesome. We have a synthetic route in mind now. So what's the problem here? Let's imagine we take this compound, treat it with magnesium metal, and make a Grignard. So we might imagine this Grignard starts to form, but this is actually a self-destructing Grignard. There's an acidic group right here. So before this Grignard could ever attack and open an epoxide forming a carbon-carbon bond, it will instead react with a unreacted molecule of starting material, deprotonating this alcohol here, and destroying the Grignard before it can even do its job. So our synthesis must incorporate a protecting group for the alcohol this time. We can protect our alcohol with this silicon group. Chlorine is going to act as a leaving group here, and we'll put this group onto the molecule. This group is tert-butyl dimethyl silyl chloride, and is sometimes abbreviated TBDMS chloride, or more commonly, TBS chloride. So we get this whole big group on here. The group is base stable. The base in this reaction is an amine base, so it just takes that proton off after the TBS group is on the alcohol. And a commonly used base in this reaction is imidazole. Now we don't usually draw this whole group on here. Let me just show you how we would abbreviate this structure. Now that this oxygen contains a base stable protecting group, we can go ahead and form a Grignard here and attack this epoxide. Now if this workup is acidic, that might knock off our TBS group right then, and so we might kick off the TBS and free up our alcohol. However, we're gonna say it did not here, and I wanna show you the standard conditions for removing a TBS group, which is a fluoride compound called TBAF. This is a fluoride salt, tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride, and it looks like this. So the F minus of TBAF comes in, attacks at silicon, forming a complex, and then this group is removed from the molecule. Let's just summarize how this met the three criteria of a protecting group. This was pretty easy to put on. We just needed this compound here in the presence of a base, probably a midazole and we were able to put the silicon group onto our oxygen. It was stable when we formed a Grignard over here and used that to open this epoxide, and then it was easily removed with TBAF. So far in this lesson, we looked at protecting groups for aldehydes and ketones. The acetal is a good one. We also looked at how to protect an alcohol from deprotonation by nucleophiles and looked at the TBS group. Another group that we commonly need to protect is amines. So let's take this third example. We're looking at the alkylation of this OH group. So we're adding a methyl or a CH3 here. And we're leaving this nitrogen unreacted. First, let's just ignore the amine over here and look at what we would need to use to turn this alcohol into this methyl group. We can use a reaction called the Williamson ether synthesis, where we first deprotonate this hydrogen atom here, and then we alkylate with something like iodomethane. A great base to use for this reaction is sodium hydride. 
This will deprotonate our alcohol completely, forming an alkoxide, and as a byproduct produces hydrogen gas, which bubbles out of your reaction. Then, in a second stage of this reaction in the same flask, we can treat this with methyl iodide. And that'll alkylate our oxygen over here, giving the methyl ether. So what's the problem with having the nitrogen on there? Well, amines are great nucleophiles. So, in the presence of iodomethane, the nitrogen would be more likely to attack, becoming alkylated, than the OH group. But over here we talked about deprotonating this. So maybe we could just deprotonate with sodium hydride, and then we'd have an alkoxide, which is nice and nucleophilic, and maybe we could solve our problem that way. Let's see what would happen if we tried that. Well, certainly our alkoxide wants to react with the methyl iodide more, so this would attack, displacing iodine. Once we form this, we actually still have a nucleophilic nitrogen in the molecule. And now we don't have our alkoxide to be the better nucleophile. This is going to go ahead and alkylate, kicking off the iodine. And so we're still going to get mixtures of alkylation at the oxygen and at the nitrogen. And so we won't be able to cleanly perform this synthesis where the nitrogen is unreacted. So what should we do? You guessed it, we need to protect our amine. Amines are more nucleophilic than alcohols, not the deprotonated alkoxide, but more so than the alcohol itself. So we can capitalize on the nucleophilicity of nitrogen to introduce our protecting group. This protecting group is diterpbutyl dicarbamate. It's uh, an anhydride, but also a carbamate because of all of these oxygens. And the nitrogen is going to attack at this carbonyl, kicking off all of this group. Fortunately, just like that big TBS group, we have an abbreviation for this one as well. We call this Bach anhydride, and we write the abbreviation like this. So the Bach is representing this part of the molecule. So we have two of them and an oxygen in the middle. Nitrogen attacks here, forms a tetrahedral intermediate, we kick off the rest of the molecule, and we get this structure. Here it is with our abbreviation, and let me draw it out below. Now the nitrogen is a carbamate functional group. That's what it is when it has the nitrogen carbonyl oxygen. Like an amide, this nitrogen has lots of resonance with this carbonyl. Thus, the lone pairs that would have attacked iodomethane in that alkylation step are now tied up in resonance, making the nitrogen less reactive. It's protected because it is not as nucleophilic anymore. Now let's deprotonate our alcohol and alkylate. Now our Bach group was stable during these basic alkylation conditions. Notice it has a carbonyl, so some nucleophiles could mess with the Bach group, uh, maybe Grignards and things like that. But um, under these alkylation conditions, it's just fine. The Bach group is most commonly removed under acidic conditions, and the preferred acid for this reaction is trifluoroacetic acid, or TFA. And if we call this compound target molecule 3, that's what we get from this deprotection. Under acidic conditions, this group is removed as a tert-butyl cation, and so sometimes there's problems with alkylating other groups with that cation that's in solution, but there are other additives to work around this. Organichemistry.org has some nice tables on protecting groups, so I'll put a link to that in the video description. Thanks for watching and have a great day. KP here. If you learned something, give me a thumbs up on the way out, and for more chemistry, subscribe to my channel.